I hope everybody had a really good uh, spring break week. Either get caught up on stuff or rest or accomplish things that you needed to. For those who are really getting stressed out about how the semester is progressing, um, even after spring break, I would highly recommend going uh, contacting the on-campus accommodations office because they can really help uh, with that stress. Um, you have enough going on in your life with your family, your job, your responsibilities, all the other things you need to do. You really don't need to take on any extra stress beyond um, or any more stress than you absolutely need to. So if you, if you guys are feeling um, a little tense, I would definitely recommend contacting the, the Office of Accommodations on campus and seeing if they can um, make any suggestions to help out. Uh, as I'm going through grading, I'm going to try to get everything done uh, in the next couple of days here, uh, up to date again. As I'm going through, one thing that I notice is that the reflection as we deal with our really rapid world tour and talk a little bit about the continent of Africa, kente cloth and ceramics, uh, people are doing the same kind of reflection for both the kente cloth reflection and for the Africa reflection. And um, if that's the case, I've just asked you to resubmit the Africa one so, so that it, uh, you have an opportunity to rework it so that you uh, cover what the thing, other things we talked about in the module in addition to Kente cloth and uh, the things, other things in addition to Kente cloth that we talked about in our Teams meeting because otherwise it uh, becomes the same thing. So, um, and sometimes people have been turning in the Africa one first and it, it reads really well as just the Kente cloth reflection. You can do that, uh, resubmit it as Kente cloth. Um, but there are two different reflections. The first one is the Kente cloth, and that needs to be focused on what Kente cloth means and the particular things that you saw in that particular section of the module. And then the second reflection deals with Africa as a continent, the 54 countries, um, the, the other art forms we talked about in the module other than just the weaving and um, your thoughts about that and our team's meeting and the other elements that are discussed in the module. All right, so if you see, if you've submitted both of those and one of them you see a zero on, just double check and look and see what I've written in the notes. But I, like I said, I'm going to uh, make sure that the grading is up to date by this weekend so that everybody can um, know where they stand. We start with the, the uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> my brain is going faster than my mouth is. The last couple of weeks, last several weeks, we've talked about basically different um, areas of the world, picking one or two art forms from a huge part of the world and pretending that that's our introduction to it. Um, it's a really, really rapid overview of art around the world. We talked about um, prehistory, little things like that. What we're now moving into is different art movements. And I wanted to touch on that just uh, really briefly. An art period is different than an art movement. An art period is going to be something like Egyptian art. An art movement is going to be something like Impressionism, which is this week's module. The difference is that an art period is encompassing um, a significant length of time and is generally, uh, sorry, the growling and barking has to do with my rather large dog who's being annoying. Hold on just a second. And, uh, the period usually is confined by a society or um, a country or a specific uh, geographical location. 
An example like this would be the period of Egyptian art. Uh, we can look at the different dynastic periods, which again are just our groups of years that are going to be generations long. Uh, we can look at uh, something like Renaissance art, that is um, art basically bound by the geographic location of greater Europe and is constricted to maybe about 350 to 500 years. And then when we start moving into movements and talk about art movements, what we're generally talking about is a very small length of time and a relatively small group of artists. Uh, for example, one art movement that is currently picking up speed is um, AI painting or painting assisted by artificial intelligence. And within that, there's a number of different art movements within that as well. But it's something that's just started within the last um, uh, couple of years at most. And it may um, the, be identified as a movement for just another couple of years and then move on, uh, morph into something else. Um, an art movement is, would also be uh, Dadaism or hyperrealism. Um, we can, uh, I think now it used to be that art movements about a hundred years ago were bound very clearly by uh, how closely people were, how closely people lived to each other. But um, so it's also, it was also restricted to geographic location. But I think nowadays, uh, an art movement is going to be participated in by artists of all around the world as they grapple with a new idea or respond to some ideas. And the difference is that um, an art period, we can generally uh, use that to help us understand a broad culture. In an art movement, we can generally use that to understand and appreciate how people think or react to something specific in history. So uh, the biggest takeaway from those uh, that short discussion is that art periods are generally going to be broader and more encompassing as, of a culture as a whole. And an art movement is going to be relatively short. It's going to be uh, a couple of years or decades long as opposed to centuries. And it's going to be defined by artists who are addressing similar ideas as opposed to an entire culture. And um, feel free to ask questions about that and we can talk about it more later. But uh, instead of doing a world tour, now we're gonna be shifting to a couple different art movements where people did, where people did address specific ideas. I am going to go and get a, a treat for the dog and hopefully that will help her to be quiet for a little bit. We'll see if that works. She likes vocalizing, as you can tell. And one of the things she vocalizes about is that she has um, two little puppies here, are chihuahuas. And um, the dog that you heard barking is uh, rather large. She's about 60 pounds, and the chihuahuas are about maybe seven ounces. <laughs> They're under five pounds. And it's really hilarious to see these little chihuahuas intimidate the snot out of this gigantic dog. But that's why she was barking because her sisters were picking on her. Anyway, as we go into talking about Impressionism, there are some things to consider. This is where we start looking at art as it reflects how the world is changing and moving. Uh, the Renaissance did that a little bit. We, we looked at the Italian Renaissance the, that was over a couple centuries, and it was just lots and lots of people trying to adjust to the new wor way the world was becoming. Um, and now, we at the, towards the end of the Renaissance, we start moving into the, the pre-industrial um, revolution. And then the Industrial Revolution starts picking up full swing at the end of the 18th century into the 19th century. So as it goes into the 1800s. And um, I think Impressionism is a direct result of how much the world has changed 
through the Industrial Revolution. There is a quote that I wanted to share uh, from Vincent van Gogh. I really like him. I, there has been some really good um, impressions of Vincent van Gogh in cinema, but I think my very favorite one is a short bit in uh, one of the Doctor Who episodes where Vincent van Gogh uh, helps to save the world because of the way that only he can see things. And um, he was just really sad about how he thinks he doesn't mean anything in, in the view of the world. And so Doctor Who brings him forward a uh, hundred years and has a museum curator talk about how awesome Vincent van Gogh is. If you guys are interested in that, I will um, find that clip and put a, um, and, and send a connection. I'm, if I can find it before I post this on our attendance module, then I will include that in the attendance module as well. Anyway, here's the quote from Vincent van Gogh in a letter to his brother Theo. When I hear you talk about a lot of new names, it's not always possible for me to understand when I've been absolutely nothing by them, when I've seen absolutely nothing by them. And from what you said about Impressionism, I've grasped that it's something different from what I thought it was, but it's still not entirely clear to me that one should understand by it. <laughs> I really like that. Um, uh, this short quote uh, shows that this is a very different time in terms of media consumption. There was no Google image search. There was no Google. There was no internet. Even printed books were hard to come by. And if a painter like Vincent van Gogh wanted to see what Impressionist paintings look like, they would have to wait until an exhibition of paintings came somewhere nearby and then travel to see the exhibition. Like one of the things we talked about is um, for a lot of the history of the world, people would live and die within 20 or 30 miles from where they were born. And in the 19th century, in the 1800s, that's when we start seeing this tremendous powerhouse of the train and steam engines start really making the world dramatically smaller. We talked about how uh, shipping technology and transportation technology really changed during the Renaissance. Here is taking another dramatic leap. Within a person's lifetime, they could see somebody taking weeks and weeks and weeks to go halfway across the world. And now you could get to the world in less than a month and a half. And um, I don't know if you guys remember the Jackie Chan movie, Around the World in 80 Days. This that took place in the 19th century, and it is that was written as a science fiction novel at the time. It was absolutely mind boggling to anybody that you get all the way around the world in less than a year. But because of uh, steam technology and everything else that people were developing, uh, it the world kept feeling smaller and smaller, and uh. People were starting to think about the world you know, as it was viewed through the windows of where they traveled. I think this is the first time when um, we talked about transportation technology making travel time a lot shorter. But I think with the invention of the train, it made it so that people could actually see a dramatic increase or a dramatic change in how they viewed the world as they were traveling. Because this is when you start seeing uh, blurred landscapes because the train is moving so quickly. Shh. <laughs> I hope you can't hear her complaining too much. She's getting scared by a little, little chihuahua in front of her. But um, that is a really big part of what made Impressionism or made... Uh, the world ready for impressionism, I guess, or what made, um, or what inspired impressionism. Just this uh, incredible te technological advance just in the way that people move uh, with the invention of trains. If we look before impressionism, and impressionism is going to be right around mid 19th century, mid 1800s, that's when it starts really picking up steam. Uh, before then, uh, particularly the, during the Renaissance, we can see this, 
artists were focusing on realism. They wanted things to look as close to what you could see with your, your actual unaided eye as possible. And we can see that with a lot of the studies in uh, perspective that uh, we read about from the Renaissance. Um, and the subject matter that artists focused on before Impressionism had a lot to do with the interests of the people that were um, their, their patrons, essentially. And those interests were usually to uh, cement the patron's position in society. Um, and that would mean that a lot of these paintings would be of historical events or uh, biblical events. So um, things that were important to the community's history, uh, to the society's history, or to um, the people's understanding of uh, religious work, particularly as it relates to um, uh, behavior within a community. And again, I'm, I'm talking mostly about Europe. Um, this is this is the environment that we're, we're dealing with um, in Europe. And then also you can see, so you'd have the historical imagery, you'd have the biblical imagery, and then um, a bit, another big one, huge one, was portraiture of uh, figures that were deemed important, like community leaders or um, members of the families of the patrons. We can also see that um, the paintings, in addition to being very realistic, were very tight and controlled. The artists spent a lot of time getting things just exactly right. Uh, a lot of this idea, I think, of what we have today about uh, perfectionism, and it, where it becomes almost an OCD kind of thing, you can see that echoed in a lot of um, particularly Renaissance uh, painters, what, what they would do. And I, I think it's fascinating a little bit, but we can understand kind of where they were coming from. Many times color and pigments would be very difficult to attain and the colors themselves would be very expensive. And so, and there's evidence that uh, many painters would do black and white paintings, get them as detailed as possible, and then apply the color uh, towards the end of the painting process overlapping the, the grayscale that they had already done. And uh, so we can see that a lot of the style comes from this idea that materials were difficult to get a hold of. Sorry, one of the dogs is, I'm gonna let her out and then she's gonna have to stay outside until we're done talking. I don't think she'll like that. Shh. <sighs> Sigh. When we move into Impressionism, some of the things that we'll see right away are a lot of the artists were more focused on what was interesting to them. Uh, paintings or the materials that you use to make painting was a lot easier to access for the artists. And uh, we see, but we see that um, during Impressionism, artists focused on their own personal expression. The works that they would do were more subjective. It was about their perspective, their expression, and, and then also their, their perspective, their individual perspective, instead of trying to make um, a generic uh, general perspective that everybody in the community could enjoy you got to actually see what the artist was thinking inside their head. And uh, a lot of the subject matter, instead of focusing on historical events, biblical events, or the portraiture of famous, important and rich and wealthy people, a lot of the subjects became things like um, ordinary day-to-day -day events, uh, landscapes that were unimportant to anybody other than the artists themselves, what they thought was particularly fascinating. And uh, this is, you've probably heard the phrase plain air, or um, if you walk around downtown, uh, some of the galleries will have plain air paintings or there'll be a plain air festival. That means painting outside. And that's when this really started where the artists would take their supplies, they would go outside and just paint outside. 
and you know enjoy the air while they were painting. But what, one of the things that I think is really interesting about um, Impressionism is that the artists were really focusing on the quality of the materials that they had access to and that they were using and doing it in such a way so that we as viewers could participate in that process um, and enjoy a little bit of uh, what the artists were doing. I'm sorry, I'm leaning back so it makes it look like my head is really tiny. But, um, and these are really significant departures from how um, patronized painting was done up until this time. We did talk a little bit of earlier about uh, the gallery system. Uh, people, because of the industrial revolution, the middle income, uh, the population of people that were um, had access to uh, disposable income dramatically increased than the way it was under the feudal system just a, a few generations earlier. So people had uh, disposable income where they could also afford things like their own paintings, uh, but they weren't wealthy enough to be patrons themselves. And so what they would do is look for places that would sell uh, what artists were working on. And uh, this is how the gallery system started to develop because these were businesses that uh, became essentially a middleman be between uh, the artists who produce work for the middle income population and the middle income families that could uh, pay for this work. There were still patrons and, and things like that, but because of what the industrial revolution did for middle income families, making it actually possible to survive outside and even be wealthy outside of a feudal system without being born into uh, wealth or um, uh, royal or um, noble families. Uh, that really made it so that a lot of artists could do their stuff and explore things like self-expression. Um, one of my favorite painters is an American woman whose name was Mary C uh, Cassatt, who went to France, and her subject matter was just things that she identified with as um, just a woman, uh, not trying to make herself a, a hero or a mythical figure, but just um, showing the important roles of an ordinary person living an ordinary life with an ordinary family. And her works are um, incredibly beautiful because of the, the sincerity and the enjoyment that she had in uh, what she was doing, working with the materials that she uh, chose to use. Leading into uh, the Impressionism, uh, that movement really got started in the mid 19th century. So that we're talking about uh, mid 1800s up to the early part of the 1900s. This, we talked about the Industrial Revolution, we talked about the, the train. This is where we also get um, the invention of the daguerreotype and um, basically portable cameras, essentially. The first time the cameras were really used to document was um, as just a means of uh, journalism was during the American Civil War. Uh, that's when it, it really um, took off as a device for documentation. Because at that time, even though there was photography and, and some elements before then, by that time, uh, the uh, tripod had been invented and the camera materials and development uh, materials were essentially transportable. People could actually, they were small enough and light enough that people could move them around. Of course, we, the camera at this time was still the size of a small suitcase and we were still printing on glass plates. Um, you still had um, a lot of, you still had to have people hold really, really still uh, because the exposure times were very long, but uh, it represented a dramatic shift in how people could access uh, visual documentation. And that had a big uh, part to play in Impressionism as well, because I, as an artist, I think a lot of artists ask themselves, you know, if I have this gift or I have this skill, um, 
what can I supply that can't be supplied in a simple photograph? And I, I think a lot of artists were, were asking themselves that question, which lent, to, uh, lent them to a lot of self-expression. This is also the beginning of an understanding of um, atomic theory. People are experimenting with electricity, under, appreciating that electricity uh, represents a, a movement or exchange of electrons and energies based on um, uh, the, the reality of atomic structures. You get uh, remarkable women like uh, Madame Curie and people starting to realize that radiation is a real thing. You get the development of the technologies that later became x-rays and um, just a really a burgeoning understanding and appreciation for the physical structures of uh, chemicals um, and uh, elements, different things like that. So these kinds of ideas where the world is change, the understanding of the world is changing on a fundamental level. And atomic theory is not entirely new. Um, philosophers have discussed it for thousands of years, um, but the capacity to actually be able to prove it and use um, photo uh, sensitive plates to map the passage of electrons, uh, that is something that is completely new at this time. So there, there's, uh, so we're talking about steam engines, we're talking about trains, we're talking about uh, photography, and we're talking about atomic theory. All these are very strong technological advancements that happen very quickly. But uh, in the world of art, what we're also talking about is things like um, a lot of goods are being shipped from Japan, for example, that are being wrapped in Japanese woodblock prints. And these represent a completely different way of looking at um, the world. I know that a lot of you have seen that famous image, especially if you go, I think the, I want to say uh, Hokulia, uh, Shave Ice uses it in their logo, I'm not entirely sure, but the, the ocean wave that everybody knows about was uh, actually originated as a woodblock print. It was a view of Mount Fuji by one of these Japanese artists. And uh, they would make these woodblock prints that we now see as incredibly beautiful, but they would use them as um, packing paper to ship things, uh, prestige items from Japan to Europe. And so artists were seeing that and seeing what um, woodblock prints from Japan look like. That really heavily informed uh, how Vincent van Gogh organized his paintings. But then also we see um, the technology to develop different colors of pigment. Uh, dramatically increased. With the available availability of materials and cheap processing due to the Industrial Revolution, uh, artists had access to blue, things like uh, blue and red a lot easier and a lot cheaper than they had. Uh, before the um, Industrial Revolution, most pigment was uh, more earthy. You get the, the very warm tones. You're talking browns, uh, grays, um, kind of yellows, th tans, things like that. And after the Industrial Revolution, because of the process, the cheap processing of materials and access uh, to raw material, then we start seeing um, pigments that start developing that are like pink and bright green, bright blue. Uh, so something like Monet's um, lilies would be uh, almost impossible for him to afford to paint uh, even a hundred years earlier. But that's because of the access to all this um, uh, color technology. And then we also see that um, in the 1800s, because painting, paint was, uh, became a lot less expensive to produce, they found a different way of packaging it. Before then, uh, people, if they wanted to mix their paints and save them, they would put them in uh, bladders, like pig bladders, which just kind of grossed me out a little bit, but that's what they did. And after this, 
um, during the 1800s, they invented um, what we now take for granted. Those, those uh, metal and plastic tubes you see in art stores were invented um, 150, 160 years ago at the, the tail end of the Industrial Revolution as it moves into the modern age. And um, there's been several uh, artists who said that artists like Vincent van Gogh would never have even been able to do anything without paint in tubes, which I, I, th I think is kind of startling. As you uh, move forward in this module, think about those kinds of things. Think about, think about how different uh, technology changed during the tail end of the Industrial Revolution. Now we're talking about a long enough time ago that um, the most technologically advanced communication was um, Morse code over copper wires. Uh, we're talking about the fastest you know, a train going faster than a horse was just unbelievable. There was actually an article I came across where somebody said if people ever were able to go faster than 40 miles an hour, um, that'd be the key to traveling backwards in time and the world would end. Steam engines that would, that could um, operate uh, weaving factories, for example, to make cloth at unprecedented speeds. You know, now we, we look back and we think of these things as being quaint is, you know, we can get on the, the highway and speed limit is 80 miles an hour, which is <laughs> double the, that apocalyptic speed that people were so worried about. Um, and we, we can order almost anything from Amazon. We can go online and communicate with people on the other side of the world immediately. Uh, we can buy a book and have it downloaded to our machine in a half a second, and then also listen to somebody else read it for us. These are things that was not, I mean, people weren't even dreaming about at that, that time. And we're talking 150, 160 years ago. So um, as you move into the reflection portion of this, think about, you know, try to put yourself in that position where um, the most common way for people to die in the United States was from diarrhea. Um, people would lose family members because a sliver had gotten infected and they didn't have access to um, any sort of understanding of uh, proper medical care. Um, clean water was a pipe dream for much of the world's population, you know, let alone talking about speeds of travel or speeds of, or modes of communication. So uh, think about being in an era of time when so many things are changing so rapidly. How would that affect you? And then even the understanding of the world is changing uh, from things being concrete and solid to a burgeoning awareness that atomic particles make up everything. These little teeny tiny, tiny beads, smaller than anything anybody can imagine are actually what makes stuff up. That um, people were actually at this time very much fearful that the new technology of photography would steal their souls. Uh, and, and so reflect on that, reflect on what the module talks about um, that, that world around um, Impressionism as the art artists started dressing this new um, art movement and uh, reflect on that. For the studio painting, what we're going to be doing is, because this is so subjective, this, what you're going to be doing for the painting is, I don't want you buying any new paints or anything like that. You just use the ones that you used for um, the, uh, two previous exercises, the line paint, the line drawing painting one, and the one where we did um, uh, as a, a result of our world tour visiting Asia, Japan and China. Um, just use those paints that you already have. And this works best if you 
squeeze paint out of the tubes, whatever you're using, and don't worry about making a mess on the paper or anything else. And think about how does the light reflect off of areas of whatever it is that you're painting, as opposed to trying to make an apple or whatever it is that you're using as your subject. Um, think about how the surface feels as you're uh, working on it. Think about how you feel it should feel. And um, the, the grading for this is more indicative of how um, honest you are in the work that you're doing and how um, uh, the intent with which you approach things as opposed to uh, technical mastery. Because again, this class, it's an introduction to art. Nobody's going to have technical mastery, so we're not worried about that. And you may even want to work on the painting, let it dry for a bit, let it sit for a bit, and go back and, diddle, and deal with it again, uh, fiddle with it, uh, add some more. Uh, Vincent van Gogh would do that all the time, go back over, rework things. Um, Monet didn't like to do that. He wanted to do everything as rapidly as possible. Uh, and been, and um, other artists would approach things from a different way. But one thing that you can see that's very similar to them is that they paid a lot more attention to how light reflects off of the surface rather than how realistic something looks. So, so be thinking about that. If you have any other questions or anything like that, feel free to email me and I'll address them in uh, next week's meeting. Like I said, I'm working on getting the grading done and caught up by this week, by the end of this weekend. So everybody should know where they are. I'm sorry, I'm scratching. My, I'm really itchy right around here, and that's where I'm scratching. I'm not trying to pick my nose, so please don't think that I am. I hope you guys have a wonderful week, and I look forward to visiting with you next Tuesday. If you have any other questions or any other concerns, please, like I said, uh, let me know. <laughs>